Welcome to Urban Agriculture. This webinar is one in a series exploring healthy community strategies presented by Change Lab Solutions and hosted by the Network for a Healthy California. My name is Heather Wooten, and I'm a Senior Planner and Program Director with Change Lab Solutions, where I've had the opportunity to work with communities across California and around the country on developing successful urban agriculture plans and policies. I'm joined by my colleague Ben Winnig, a Senior Staff Attorney and Program Director. He and I have teamed up to create a toolkit for community groups seeking to establish urban agriculture programs on public land, and he's here to provide some tips and guidance for doing just that. Our guest today is Mandy Sharp, a program manager with the Tahama County Community Action Agency, where she's been leading some innovative efforts to bring gardens to a rural community in Northern California. And here's a little bit about us. Change Lab Solutions is a nonprofit that partners with state and local leaders to create healthy communities using the tools of law and policy. We do that through research, resource development, and training. Here's our agenda. First, we're going to define urban agriculture and understand more about the many ways people grow food in communities. Next, we'll learn about a collaborative garden project that brought together some unlikely partnerships. We'll hear from Ben about one way to increase access to land for urban agriculture by growing food on public property. Then we'll discover a community garden that travels to the community. And last, I'll share some examples of local policies that can protect and enhance access to urban agriculture. If you have a question about any of these topics, be sure to send your question in via the chat window, and we'll be taking your questions along the way. During this webinar, we'll be using the term urban agriculture to describe a range of food growing practices. Note that many of the examples we're citing aren't just in dense cities. Urban agriculture can happen wherever people are growing food in their communities, in cities, suburbs, and in small towns. When we talk about different categories of urban agriculture, it's important to think about the who, what, when, where, and why, and note how different forms serve different purposes and have different needs in terms of land, people, and other resources. Communities use lots of terms to describe urban agriculture, from market gardens to communal gardens to community-supported agriculture and more. We use these three categories of urban agriculture for both simplicity and clarity. First, home gardens, second, community gardens, and third, urban farms. Of course, these terms can be used or modified depending on a community's preference. From a potted tomato on a patio to a landscape yard, home gardens produce food for residents. You might grow enough to share a few zucchinis with the neighbors, but home gardens are generally small scale. Community gardens engage multiple individuals and families from across the neighborhood or community. They generally produce food for personal consumption of participants or for donation. Urban farms are larger scale or more intensive food growing activities that might be serving a neighborhood or even citywide. They can be run by nonprofit or for profit organizations and often include some entrepreneurial components like growing food for sale. Now that we have a shared vocabulary for talking about urban agriculture, let's hear from you. What do you consider to be the most important benefit of urban agriculture? And go ahead and fill in our poll. We've got a number of answers here, and it looks like the clear winner um, amongst today's webinar participants was around improving access to fruits and veggies. Although um, a number of you indicated that learning about where food comes from and greening urban environments and building community connections were important features of urban agriculture as well. One of the amazing things about urban agriculture is the diversity of benefits it brings to communities and how different communities design their urban agriculture projects to achieve different goals. Integrating food growing into places where people live, work, and play supports healthy eating, community resilience, and food literacy. Urban agriculture can actually boost property values, promote community engagement, and support crime prevention by activating underutilized community space promoting community engagement, and increasing eyes on the street, which is a term coined by urbanist Jane Jacobs, who described the crime prevention effect that neighbors and residents have when they're able to watch over space together. 
Gardening also serves as a moderate form of exercise, and gardens themselves can often provide much-needed access to healthy recreational opportunities across generations. Urban agriculture further promotes environmental sustainability and community self-reliance by reducing dependence on supply chains that transport food over long distances. In the event of a natural or man-made disaster that interrupts transportation networks, urban agriculture can increase food security by providing a local food source. Urban agriculture can also create green spaces that provide ecological services to municipalities, such as mitigating stormwater runoff and reducing treatment plant loads, pollution of water rays, and increasing infiltration. Across California, communities have developed specific urban agriculture projects to meet their local conditions and needs. In the Eastern Sierras, the Inyo Mono Community Action Agency has created a desert-ready community garden with wind-resistant structures that protect plants against temperature variation and tough weather. In San Francisco, Urban Sprouts runs a youth development program called Schoolyard to Market that brings students from three high school to the Ferry Building Farmers Market where they sell produce and vegetable seedlings they've grown themselves. And on the American River Ranch near Sacramento, Soil-born farms engages youth and adults in hands-on service and educational activities, producing vegetables and fruit to meet the needs of Sacramento residents, particularly those in underserved neighborhoods with little or no access to fresh, nutritious food. It's clear that urban agriculture has taken root in so many communities. Let's hear from Andy Sharp about what it really takes to make projects happen. Hi, and good morning. Um, I'm Amanda Sharp, and I'm a program manager for the Community Action Agency, as well as the Department of Social Services uh, CalWORKs Division in Tehama County, California. And I'd like to speak today about a couple different garden projects. We're going to focus on the first project, but first a little bit of information about the agency and how uh, really the community gardens and our garden projects have fit into our organization. This is a a graphic depiction of our strategic plan. And the reason I have this on here as a slide is to help people understand that every organization, many organizations, require some kind of a, a guidepost or milestone in order to be able to determine what it is that we want to be able to do. And the Community Action Agency is governed by a tripartite board of directors as well as the board of supervisors at the county level because we are a county agency. Um, this is a graphic depiction of our strategic plan, and the reason it's important is because some of the elements of our service and delivery, um, our com community outreach focus, and other areas that were identified as important, the community and collaborative gardens that we've established fit within that strategic plan structure, and that's really been helpful in, as far as getting um, support to make those projects happen. Here's a little bit about Tehama County. Um, mentioned earlier, I'm, I work in the Tehama County Community Action Agency and the Department of Social Services. So typically the first question I get asked is, where is Tehama County? <laughs> so here's a picture of the map of California with all the counties indicated, and you can see the circle there for Tehama County. We're just south of Shasta County. The major city in Shasta County is Redding. And we're just north of Butte County. The major city there is Chico. In Tehama County, we have three incorporated cities. We have Red Bluff, Corning, and the city of Tehama. Um, it's a large geographic area, about 3,000 square miles. And it has a very high level of poverty. It's an agricultural area um, and lots of low income folks. And our county is a USDA food desert. So now we'll speak a little bit um, about our first project that we're going to profile here. And this project we've called the Collaborative Garden. Here's a picture of the Tehama County Collaborative Garden. Um, and this is on site um, under administration by various different organizations. So the Tehama County Community Action Agency was involved with the Collaborative Garden Project basically originating through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So this was back in 2009-2010. Um, our agency received some special funding identified to serve and start community gardens. And several garden partners were identified in the county. We received requests for a proposal and rated and ranked and scored these proposals. And we were able to fund uh, two American Recovery Act projects, one of which was the Collaborative Garden Project. The Collaborative Garden Project really fits into this presentation because it shows the benefit of one of those items that was on the poll, 
um, and that is the development of community partnerships and coalitions and um, ways to collaborate with partners that you might not necessarily expect. So this is a picture of the Collaborative Garden several years into the process. I took this about three months ago. We call this a Collaborative Garden because it isn't doesn't really fit under the traditional definition of a community garden. And the reason for that is because in large part of our unexpected partnerships. This garden is housed at, is located at Juvenile Hall. And um, you may not notice on the picture that was shown earlier, but it is actually enclosed in a, in a gated area that's locked and um, you have to have a reservation, an appointment, so to speak, in order to use or access the garden to work there or get some of the produce. And the reason for that is because it's um, a collaborative project with Juvenile Hall and um, is used now with the Juvenile Hall um, students that are there um, in order to be able to learn more about nutrition education. It is a reward system. It's a mental health um, uh, resource for them. Some of the other partners that are involved are WIC, Public Health, Mental Health, the CalWORKs Welfare to Work Program, Community Action Agency, a local nursing home, uh, various local nonprofits, and an organization that we have in our county called Food Share, which is a grassroots organization of anyone who's interested in food and nutrition and hunger related issues. How those partners work together. Um, is very interesting. Juvenile Hall administers and maintains the garden and has a ready group of people to work at the garden. But they also invite partners from within the community to come in and use the garden and work in the garden and volunteer in the garden and then use the produce that, is, that comes from it. And some of those folks happen to be coming from county mental health or public health. They could be CalWORKs participants, groups from the different areas that are listed on the slide. The nursing home benefits because we now have a wildflower cutting area and the garden um, participants will cut flowers and they will be brought to the nursing home for people who live there. Um, local nonprofits and food share benefits because the, bounty, the bountiful harvest is way too big even for the, the needs of Juvenile Hall for feeding the residents. So the excess produce is shared within the community through more of an organized structure um, of the food share program. One of the reasons this program, the Collaborative Gardens, has been so successful is because of its regulated usage. Um, we don't have the concerns about vandalism or theft from the garden. We didn't have concerns about uh, space or land usage, which we'll be talking about later in the presentation. And we have a community benefit in addition to this kind of a captive audience that's there, the, the, the young people that, that are at Juvenile Hall are working there. Um, we get a huge community benefit because these collaborative partners are seeing a different side of organizations that they might not normally have seen. And in addition to that, the kids who are at Juvenile Hall are seeing a different side of sometimes administrations that they think of in a different way. Um, when they're working with them hand by hand, digging things and installing irrigation and um, learning about crops and types of food. This is a picture of the newer section of the Collaborative Garden. They've added a whole new section. Um, basically our role um, in the Collaborative Garden was providing seed money. Um, but here are some of the issues I just mentioned that hadn't been really large, and that's one of the reasons why the Collaborative Garden has been successful so quickly. We didn't have land use issues. We didn't have staff or volunteer issues because we had a ready captive audience, security production. We do have great linkages within the community. The garden itself has become self-supporting, which is one of the major goals that we had as Community Action, that we wouldn't be um, supporting it financially year after year that the organizations benefiting from it would be taking it over and making sure that it was self-supporting. And this organization itself, um, Juvenile Hall and the group that works in the Collaborative Garden, um, another organization I didn't mention in, in the previous slide was the Sanitary Landfill. We've, gotten, um, we've been able to find funds but through these different partners that are involved to, in order to keep it self-supporting. And obviously there's an enormous community benefit because of the produce that's coming out of it, but the mental health improvements, the physical activity, the learning about nutrition education, and the, the bringing together of community partners.
Thanks so much for that, Mandy. We'll be hearing more from Mandy at another innovative garden project in a bit. Thinking about all the pieces that Tehama County brought together to launch their community garden, their collaborative garden project, what elements do you have in place for a successful urban ag project? So go ahead and check all that apply for your local community. I'm seeing a lot of folks who have community engagement strategies in place. I'll give you a few more minutes to answer, or I should say a few more seconds to answer. Let's look at our results. So you can see here um, a huge proportion of folks participating today have a community engagement strategy in place, which I think is a really critical component of successful urban agriculture projects. They don't succeed without the support of the community around them, and I think uh, Mandy's presentation just demonstrated that by talking about the sustainability of their garden going forward uh, because of the support that different partners in the community are providing. Um, there's also a number of you who have um, other elements in place. If you want to ask questions about uh, any of the um, elements that we're posting here, feel free to do so. And many of you have um, funding to pay for infrastructure, which is also really critical. Let's talk more about how public land can be a great resource for urban agriculture and how to craft agreements that expand access to public land. We'll take questions after the next segment, so keep them coming in. Thanks, Heather. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Ben Winnig. Um, I don't know if it was the brilliantly designed survey or what, but the uh, least uh, voted upon answer was having agreements in place to access land, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. So kudos to the uh, survey, or perhaps that was just coincidental. Um, we're going to spend the next 10 or so minutes talking about using agreements to access public land in particular, and some of the key things to look for in those agreements to ensure that everyone's involved understands one another's roles and responsibilities. Uh, keep in mind that I used to practice as a muni municipal lawyer, and I represented public agencies up and down the state, and so I bring that perspective to this discussion as well. Now, when entering into an agreement with a public agency, I think it's critical for community partners and other stakeholders to know that the agency likely has some form agreement that they're going to give the community group or gardening group to review and sign on to. Very, it'll be very unlikely for a community group to bring an agreement to a public agency. And depending on the type of public agency it is, whether it's a city or a special district, there may be a variety of agreement types to be used for growing food on public property. And so I want to just talk about a few of those very briefly. Um, the most common agreements that are used for growing food on public land are licenses or leases, the first two items on the list. And we'll talk briefly about shared use or joint use agreements and also informal arrangements. Um, a lease, as I'm sure folks know, is, is an actual contract between the owner of the land, here the public entity, uh, that conveys the right to use and occupy the land to another person or another entity, like a gardening group. Uh, typically that's done for an, an something uh, in exchange for something of value. We, those of us who live in apartments know that that exchange of value is a rent. Um, and so the same rules apply. The one who leases the property has the right to solely occupy and use the property for the duration of the lease. That's how a lease works. And again, that's the most common form that we see when public agencies are um, entering into agreements with gardening groups to use public land to grow food. A license is, is another common approach. It's also a contract. Um, a license gives, uh, an, the landowner gives a person or an entity permission to engage in a particular activity on the property, uh, but it gives more limited access and use to the property than a lease does. Um, and then we have shared use or joint use agreements. That term uh, is being used in the field, um, the both terms are being used in the field. Typically these are between two government entities, 
but they can be between a government entity and, let's say, an established nonprofit organization, and I'll mention an agreement uh, that talks about such an organization in a minute. Um, and these agreements set forth, set, sets forth the rights and responsibilities of the parties regarding the shared use of that property. Um, and of course, informal, arrange informal arrangements are not uncommon in the urban agricultural world. But I just wanted to know there's, a, there's several good reasons to perhaps formalize an arrangement that, that, does, that is not in writing and that's based on perhaps uh, practice. Uh, first and foremost, a signed contract provides both parties or all parties with enforceable rights in case something goes wrong. So there's actually something you can point to in writing and say, hey, you have failed to perform this act and you, have a, and you as a signee to the agreement would have a right to enforce that. Um, second, as I'm sure we all know, informal arrangements are dependent upon the goodwill of those who make them. And when key personnel leave or change jobs, expectations may change as well and practice may cease. Long-standing practice may cease. And finally, the mere process of negotiating and signing a form formal agreement actually provides a vehicle or platform for parties to learn about each other's expectations and concerns, address those concerns in writing, and it gets everyone on the same page. Um, so it allows folks to better understand their rights and responsibilities so when and if a conflict does arise, the written agreement can lay out how, uh, how the parties can resolve such disputes. So those are the four types of arrangements we see typically when we're talking about urban agriculture on public property. Now remember I mentioned that when entering into an agreement with a public agency, most likely community partners are going to be given a, some sort of form agreement that the agency uses, and that agreement is going to contain numerous provisions, and I want to talk about a few of those to look out for. Um, one of the first issues that arises when partnering with a public entity is liability, and it shows up in two ways. Uh, one, indemnification, and two, insurance. And I just want to help define these terms, and I'm happy to answer any of those questions after the webinar about those terms as well. So when you agree to indemnify someone, it means that you will reimburse that person for any loss that's suffered due to either your own actions or uh, the actions of a third party or, some, or a failure to take action. So let's say, for example, someone sues a public entity because they were injured, about, uh, they were injured on that property and, that, and they were on the property uh, because of an agreement concerning the use of that property for growing food. The organization that, that agreed with the public entity to, and indemnified them, under such an arrangement, they would be required to pay for all the costs that were incurred by the public entity as a result of the lawsuit, including any monetary damages that were awarded by court. So that's what indemnify means. You agree to pay for those costs that the public entity incurs as a result of the lawsuit um, emanating from the injury. Typically, indemnification is not a, a negotiable term with a public entity, but you should always make sure that there's an exception to the duty to indemnify, and that exception revolves around whether any harm or injury was caused by either willful misconduct or intentional behavior or gross negligence on behalf of the public entity itself. Insurance is another term that uh, comes up a lot in the beginning of negotiations. I'm sure everyone is familiar with what insurance is, and, and all I want to say about it is that all public agencies carry some form of liability insurance, and I think it's up to the food growing groups to uh, ask the city or whatever uh, public agency it is whether food growing uh, or growing food is a covered activity under the terms of that policy. And it may or may not be depending on what type of agency you're partnering with and what type of land it is. Next, I want to talk about maintenance and utilities and what can go into that. And the main point of this slide is to talk about partnerships. Um, food growing organizations can and should negotiate with public agencies based on the anticipated use of the property, uh, based on what the local climate is, based on what the costs are to run, let's say, water or lighting uh, to the property. And, you know, sometimes it can be more expensive for an, for an urban ag group to install a meter for water and power it than it is perhaps for a public agency to do it. So it's important to understand that and negotiate those terms with the public agency. Um, 
The other thing in a, any agreement should uh, contain, contain is a list of contact people uh, f for the agency and any individual who is responsible for maintaining the property so that in case of emergency, there's someone to call, let's say, if a water main breaks or if there's been um, if someone breaks into an enclosed structure or whatnot. So that's always an important part of the maintenance and utility aspect of an agreement. Um, in terms of sustainable growing practices and pest management, um, there's a, a couple points I want to make. Um, first, it's always important to address the use of pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers up front in any agreement. Many agreements with public agencies will ban the use of chemicals or some pesticides. Others allow for the least toxic that are out there in the market. Um, and some even require imp the implementation of a pest management program um, that may or may not use pesticides or other chemicals. Uh, make sure you're familiar with both not only your state law, but also your local law and any public agency policy that may dictate what can or cannot be used on public property. And if you're talking about school property or other special uh, character or other special types of property, there's usually, there's usually going to be special rules that you should be aware about. Um, oftentimes, rules addressing uh, rules about school property uh, prohibit the use of most pesticides and most chemicals. Um, the other thing to notice about is what are the properties that neighbor the site. So for example, if you're going to be downwind from another property, you know that that property uses some sort of chemicals or fertilizers. That's important to know. Uh, and it's also important to know because, for example, the example I'm going to be talking about in a minute is located next to a creek. Uh, and so, and that, and that creek, by the way, was home to sensitive fisheries, and so it was important for this particular group to agree not to use certain types of pesticides that could um, injure the aquatic uh, life in that creek. Relatedly is contamination. Um, and it's important for folks to keep in mind that growing food on public, prop on public property always is going to require that the property is free of contamination and that any materials used to grow food will not contaminate the property over time. Uh, so folks should remember to do soil testing when they're looking for a site to grow food on. Um, that should be done before an agreement is signed, of course, because you'd want to know what you're getting into. Um, and we always recommend that any soil test results be attached to the agreement so both parties are in agreement on what the site was at the time of agreement signing in terms of its contamination or lack thereof. Um, Furthermore, uh, most public agency agreements will contain provisions addressing the use of uh, hazardous materials, as those terms are defined in various federal, state, and local codes. So that's important to note that you'll see that in an agreement. Um, and you're going to also want to clarify when you're partnering with a public agency, uh, what is your responsibility for cleanup and restoration of a site? If you know, for example, that you're going to be using X, Y, and Z type of, of fertilizers, and the public agency is aware of that, it's important to also address what you will need to do uh, in terms of cleanup if the urban agricultural use ever ceases. So that's another key point to remember. Uh, moving on to a little bit different topic, access and security. Um, the only point that I really want to make about this is that many urban agricultural projects are enclosed by a fence or maybe even a locked gate. Um, sometimes people think this may, you know, this is in odds with the notions of a public space because it's public property, but it's also important to gauge the characteristics of the community. It's important to prevent vandalism, thefts of plants, thefts of, theft of tools, and so controlled access is one way uh, to keep gardeners and um, related infrastructure secure. Uh, schools, of course, listed on the slide, have their own set of needs to protect uh, students and the only point I want to make here is that oftentimes volunteer gardeners or um, staff of, of the Urban Ag Project will need to go through uh, certain background checks, some, and then some states even fingerprint checks in order to access the site. And so that's something to be aware of and not to be surprised if you're asked to go through uh, such a background screening if you're uh, working on a school site. Um, finally, I want to talk about the idea of improvements. Um, and if you think about your apartment or if you lease an office, improvements is always going to be a term in the lease that's going to determine what types of things you can or cannot do to the property. Can you install desks? Can you hang pictures, et cetera? 
So in the gardening context, are we allowed to erect raised beds? Are we allowed to trench for irrigation? If so, what does that look like? Can we construct a shed to house our materials? Um, all those things should be worked out ahead of time. Um, the other thing that should be worked out ahead of time is if improvements are allowed, what happens to them if one of the parties terminates the agreement or someone violates the agreement? Who owns those improvements? Do you have to take them down, et cetera? Uh, the best way to address this is to identify the expected improvements before or during the agreement drafting process and then list those improvements as an agreement, or excuse me, as an attachment to the agreement that can be amended as time goes on so that both parties um, are aware of what those improvements are and they can um, and, and also make changes as their needs change over time. So I just want to talk about one example uh, of, of how this played out so nicely in a, lot, in a uh, California community. This is in the town of Lafayette. And this is it. the reason why I want to highlight this is because of the parties that were involved. Uh, there was property that was owned by E.B. Mudd, uh, which is a special district, a utility district that services um, water. Uh, the East Bay Mud had entered into a license agreement with the city of Lafayette uh, for Lafayette residents to use this property as a uh, community garden. Um, but the city of Lafayette didn't want to take on any of the uh, liability or whatnot, so they entered into a sub-license agreement and transferred those certain liability and obligations to a nonprofit organization. And so here you had a Again, a special district, a utility district, um, EB Mud, uh, entering an agreement with the city of Lafayette, a municipality, who in turn entered, it, entered into agreement with the nonprofit, which was called Sustainable Lafayette, that was interested in these types of issues. Um, and the different types of agreements and arrangements between the different types of public entities really illustrates how creative communities can make something happen in, on a site that otherwise um, people would think, well, this is not really owned by the city. How are we going to access it? EB Mud won't enter into an agreement with a nonprofit. They only work with other public agencies. And so all the players here were able to make a creative arrangement to help um, this garden not only uh, uh, be implemented but also flourish. And it's, it's still there now and doing very well. So with that, I will end. Um, if there's any other questions folks have about issues I talked about or anything else, please let me know in the Q&A time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. And I just want to highlight something. Um, this is related to some questions that I think folks had. Um, ben was sharing information that you can find in our toolkit, Dig, Eat, and Be Healthy, which is available on our website. And um, there's a lot of information about what to look for in um, agreements and how to craft agreements as well as some sample agreements that you can download directly from our website. And we actually had a question from Beth who asked that, that question specifically, can we have access to agreement forms? And I want to add something um, a little bit to that, Ben, which is, um, so you said at the beginning of your talk that uh, it's unlikely that a community group is going to approach a public agency with um, an agreement of their own, that the public agency will kind of have their own way of doing things, basically. But I'm wondering if you could say something about instances where a public agency says, uh, we've never done this before, and we don't know what the agreement should look like. Is there a way that community groups can approach them with sample agreements from other places and let them feel a little bit more comfortable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and absolutely, of course, there's exceptions to every rule. and. Um, there certainly are those public agencies out there that may not be staffed by a city attorney uh, or may not have adequate funding to develop a type of agreement that is going to be the right agreement for food growing on public property. So absolutely. Um, the resource that Heather just highlighted has some sample agreements. Um, they're not necessarily models, but they're samples, and they certainly can be used, and they have all the terms and, uh, that I talked about today in there, and the language in, in many of those agreements is, is adequate. Um, I also know of another resource that I think, Heather, you're going to mention towards the end of the talk that has some model agreements as well that has many of these terms as well. So absolutely okay to approach a public entity and say, hey, we understand you may not have done this before or you may not have the resources to draft an agreement, but here's one we found. Here's a model and or a sample, and um, these are the types of things you know, we want to talk about, and I think that's a great approach. Great. Um, 
Then uh, I had one other question for you, which has to do with um, a term that you talked about at the beginning, which was about a lease. And you said, you know, with the, the, the idea of a lease is that um, there's an exchange of something of value in order to have uh, sort of sole access to a piece of property. And, and you gave the example of um, rent. And I'm wondering if the leases that you've seen or in your experience public agencies are willing to uh, lease their property at very either low cost or no cost rates because I know a lot of community groups don't have a ton of money to pay for rent for a garden and that's one of the things that's maybe attractive about public land is that you might be able to get it at a low cost. So if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, good question. And um, if I wasn't clear, I'll clarify now. I was using that as an example of how at least typically works. When, when you're talking about um, food growing groups and public entities, uh, very often there will not be uh, any sort of monetary payment, or if there is a monetary payment in the form of rent, it'll, it will be minimal because most public agencies, and again, I'm speaking generally, see community gardening, gardening or urban agriculture, uh, if we're going to use that umbrella term, as a benefit to the community. It serves a, a public purpose. Uh, if you go back to the, sur the first survey that you talked about, Heather, or that you provided, People, talk, people mentioned urban greening. People mentioned, um, I, I think no one mentioned lower cost of food, but people mentioned urban greening um, and community connectivity. Uh, I forget what was the other main response, but all of these things are public purposes that cities or other public entities believe to be helpful to the community. And so they will oftentimes um, provide land either free or low cost in exchange for those known benefits of urban agriculture. Fabulous. And um, just one more point on that, the actual act of maintaining public land on behalf of urban agriculture groups might be a benefit to the public agency as well. Absolutely. So thanks for your questions. Keep them coming in, and uh, we'll have more questions uh, towards the end of this webinar. Uh, let's actually um, co go back to Tehama County and hear from Mandy again about another urban agriculture project that they've been working on. Thanks. I just want to say that the information we're getting so far is really useful, and I'm taking lots of notes myself. So thanks a lot for all the great information. The second project that I would like to talk about in Tehama County is a garden project where we brought the gardens to the people. And this addresses some of the issues and uh, barriers that some organizations may have with land use. It could also addr address some of the issues that some organizations who want to start community gardens may have with getting something visible um, quickly. One of the challenges that you see when you're working with groups of people and volunteers and various organizations is that they like to see some kind of movement. They want to see something happening. And that just helps the ball keep rolling and more and more people being interested in, in supporting and working in a, in, a, in a garden project, for example. Well, the problem with that sometimes is that sometimes it takes a couple of years to get the infrastructure ready to actually grow f produce. You have to get the funding for the irrigation. You have to have the land use agreements. You have to have the garden plot prep prepared. And you have to have volunteers. So sometimes that causes a problem, and so this may be a solution for some of those issues. It was certainly a solution in our, our community. So what I'd like to share with you is, our, uh, is a second community garden project that we have in Tehama County, and we've called it the Mobile Community Garden Project. Earlier I showed everyone a strategic plan that was um, shown in like cogs in a wheel to kind of help us guide ourselves in our community action agency in terms of what direction we want to take over our three-year time frame. And one of the things that came out of that, one of our action steps, was to find out more information about what the community needed. So what we decided to do is since food issues and food insecurity, the uh, USDA food desert classification and other things really want, drove us to want to know more about what was needed in the community. One of the approaches we took was to conduct a massive survey. And the survey was done, without going into too much detail, by um, asking the same set of questions among two different groups, one of which would be a group of people who are likely to receive donations of emergency food, 
and another group being people who are likely to donate emergency food. And through that set of surveys, we were able to identify some of the related issues in the community that had to do with food insecurity and food needs in the community. And we were able to use that survey data to help us understand what the needs were, but also be able to write for uh, grant funding and allocations to support some of the identified needs because we now had the data behind us to be able to show that there really was a need. And lots of issues were brought up in those surveys. A lot of issues were um, identified. But the issue that really drove the mobile community garden and has driven a lot of other related programs, not spe specifically food programs in our county, has been transportation. As I mentioned, the Tama, uh, Tama County is about 3,000 square miles, so it's a, it's a very large county geographically. But it only has around 60 to 65,000 residents. And some folks who are on the phone will say, oh, wow, that's huge compared to our county. But if you put it in terms of other counties in the state of California or other places in the United States, it really isn't a very well populated area. But we have significant transportation issues. A large percentage of people have literally no transportation other than their feet or a bicycle. And so that means that they aren't necessarily able to access food at their local market or at a farmer's market. Um, they wouldn't even be able to get to a community garden if we put one up in a neighboring community because sometimes that community can be 10, 15, 20, 30 miles away from their home. So we decided to kind of rethink um, a garden project that would not only be responsive to the strategic plan, the needs that we identified in the survey, and also some of the issues with uh, food access and interest in education, nutrition education and outreach, we wanted to address transportation. And what we found was that um, there was a project that was available that we found through um, an organization in Germany that was doing this in a, on an urban level that we could develop mobile community gardens. These are garden boxes. They're like they're planters that people have access to now in our community. And it was able to bring a bunch of groups together, again, unlikely partners, who had sort of been waiting for an opportunity to work on something like this. And until we actually received grant funding to do it, they didn't really have a venue. So the other important thing that we're noticing as a result, because we're about two-thirds of the way through the Mobile Community Garden's first year, is that we're seeing some behavior change. We're seeing people with a greater access to fresh fruits and vegetables um, who are participating in gardening activities as a physical activity, who are teaching their children about the life cycle of plants and how fruits and vegetables are grown and what they taste like. And they're exercising changes in the choices that they use to make food at their own home. So we're really seeing some really positive um, outcomes as a result. The next slide here um, describes or shows a sample of a flyer that we used to launch the Garden Box project. And what we did was a three-part uh, project where we started with um, getting information out, awareness out in the community by conducting workshops. And we did this in partnership with UC Davis. And these workshops were brought to the level of the participant. We had multiple workshops, and people could come and learn about why gardening is good and what the benefits could be about gardening. You didn't have to attend all three segments of this um, project in order to receive plants or a garden box. But a lot of people did go through all three. The second phase um, kind of followed on the heels of the first. So for instance, you might have come in February to learn about how gardening can benefit you and then come back the next week. And at the next week, we were able to integrate um, a partner, the Workforce Investment Act partner in our community who had a job skills development program. And they were looking for a project um, on how to to build something to use as an educational resource for the people going through their Workforce Investment Act job training. So we used um, their resources and they went out into the community and taught people how to build what are called earth boxes. And these are a very specific type of garden. They're self-watering. Um, they have what you would think of as a French drain tile in the bottom of them made out of PVC pipe so that you can't overwater and kill the roots. 
Um, and there's a very particular way of making them. The nice thing about these earth boxes is that they can be made out of recycled items, and they have been made out of recycled items. Kitty litter buckets, um, old pails, people's Rubbermaid containers that they might have, anything that basically can hold soil could be turned into this. So they would go to the second workshop and learn about that. And then they received, uh, many of the participants received the items needed to assemble their earth box. And then the third segment um, followed once the growing season had started. And we had a whole bunch of different groups in the community who were willing to start seedlings and um, acquire donated seeds. And we were able to hand out these seedlings at the third, in the third phase of the project, um, which was on Earth Day and at a watershed event at the Sacramento River um, Nature Center. So people who received garden boxes got these seedlings. People who didn't receive garden boxes got these seedlings. Uh, people who had been to all three elements also got these seedlings. And we also were able to, at that time, integrate people who maybe didn't need the garden box to get fresh produce but were interested in the project. And we were able to solicit um, pledges of about 4,000 pounds worth of food to be grown in the community and donated back to emergency food banks and, and directly to people who needed food. And that came from both general citizens and people who had part are participating in the Garden Box Project. This slide talks about kind of the nuts and bolts of the project. It is a grant-funded project, but um, surprisingly, about halfway through the grant um, when we did our first set of reports, we realized that we had spent almost no money. There was such an overwhelming um, interest in being part of it and donation of all kinds of different buckets and pails and um, seeds and plants and time that we didn't really spend a lot of the funds up front in the first six months. This program was really responsive to a lot of the barriers in the community. As I mentioned, transportation being the number one barrier that we were identifying because people were able to take these garden boxes and put them on their back porch, stick them on a patio, or even in organizations, uh, nonprofits, churches, and other groups in the community might have wanted two or three or ten of these buckets, um, these, these uh, garden boxes so that they could actually grow a high volume, a higher volume of produce and have a ready to start community garden, as I mentioned, that issue that takes care of some of the multi-year project issues that you have in starting a new garden. They were able to start and get a harvest right away while they were preparing soil or um, getting money to get irrigation systems, for example. This also lists some of the partners that were involved in the project. Here's a picture of some of the things that happened as a result. It's always nice to see the real pictures. The Rubbermaid containers in the school, um, that was one of the places that hosted one of our workshops. And those are some of the uh, garden box um, prototypes that were handed out to participants. In the back, you can see that there's some pails that were um, provided by Home Depot. We also used, as I mentioned, five gallon kitty litter buckets that were cleaned out and disinfected. And we showed people how they could adapt kind of the recipe of how you make these bo boxes to work for all kinds of different types of containers. Um, at our Earth Day event, we had a first ever conservation day or Earth Day event in Tehama County. We had nutrition education folks there. We showed people how they could make fresh salsa out of the items that they were growing in their own gardens. And we had a guest visit by our very own Carson Carrot. That's me posing with Carson. And you can see some pictures of some of the different activities that we did in collaboration with our nutrition ed partners in the community, teaching kids how to start seeds. Um, about a month and a half later, those plants that were started at these open events were handed out at a big tailgate food giveaway. So we addressed a whole bunch of other people that were never even part of the project in the past. And then, then we have some tools. You can see some of the Workforce Investment Act um, job training um, participants cutting the PVC pipe to go into the garden boxes. So just a, a quick slide or a little bit of an overview on food share. A lot of this work wouldn't have happened at all 
if we didn't have an organization like Food Share, so a group of people who are concerned about different issues that have to do with food. And this is not a public agency. This is not a nonprofit. This is a collaborative group that's loosely affiliated and discusses all kinds of issues in the county and how we can address those. So it's a, a grassroots organization. This group was really future directed. The, the startup of this program of Food Share, this group of people that meet, um, came with Community Action in Northern Valley Catholic Social Services coming together and thinking about the future, some of the needs that we really needed to address in the county and how we needed a group like Food Share in order to get to those. So those would be things like a food policy council and public health advocacy and policy change, partnerships among the nutrition education partners in the community, fundraisers, and different things to support the food needs. And this group has, tap, has been a, a group that we've been able to tap for volunteers to get different projects to really run. So one of the focuses that we've had in our agency is to try to figure out how we can get more for less and how we can activate the community through exemplary programs and then do a warm handoff to those organizations that want to run these things themselves. And I think that community gardens, mobile gardens, and collaborative gardens, whatever you call them, can be a really great um, driver for that to make something um, work and then teach someone how they can do it or an organization how they can do it and then they can run with that. That really allows us to activate the community and get more activities for less um, money. Um, and it's not just money. It's how can we get activate more things, more food, more programs in the community um, and get more people involved. One small fact. Um, data point that has come out of this is that since the inception of Food Share in 2011, um, our county organization, Community Action, has been able to increase the amount of food available to low-income residents from 64,000 pounds of food to 140,000 pounds of food. And because of the efforts of Food Share and some of the collaborative activities, including the gardens, we've driven the cost of food per pound from 65 cents a pound to 7 cents a pound in the community. So we really do think that there is a way to work together and get more for less. And this happens with our partnerships with farmers markets and Slow Food and different organizations as well as county agencies, nonprofits, and faith-based organizations. The kid on the bike there is, is driving a blender bike, which is one of the big hot things that kids like to see at some of the different big outreach activities that we have nutrition partners at. And here's just some examples of different publications and um, programs that we've been able to use um, along with Food Share and our agency uh, strategic plan in order to get the information out to the community about the needs for food in the community, and um, including a, a big check there for, from one of our funders. That's the end of my second project. So thank you for your patience and, and listening to our project, and I encourage any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, in our last segment, we're going to take a quick look at how local policies can support urban agriculture. So take a look at this vacant lot. I bet you can picture a similar place in your community, somewhere blighted or underutilized that urban agriculture could turn into a community resource. However, the reality is that in many cities, policies like zoning ordinances prevent that transformation from happening, or at least from happening legally. A lack of supportive policy can make it both more costly or complicated to start a new, new urban farm or community garden, and it also makes those uses uh, vulnerable. So when they are, are not actually uh, legal, they're, they're vulnerable to being shut down or displaced. There are actually a lot of ways that local governments can support urban agriculture, and I've listed some of the many agencies that might affect it from supporting access to land, to providing programming in classes, to making sure sites are accessible to residents, to even ensuring that new developments include space for urban agriculture. And I will just emphasize that one of the best ways to start coordinating public support for urban agriculture is by making a plan. So why plan for urban agriculture? First, plans engage a wide range of stakeholders and help everyone identify shared goals. 
Second, plans help us increase and protect urban agriculture by removing any regulatory barriers we might have. And third, plans help us look holistically across the community and identify actually strategic places for new gardens, as well as establishing priorities for supporting new and ongoing urban agriculture activities. And I want to show you one quick example from the city of Alameda. Here we worked with the city of Alameda on an urban farm and garden plan, and we included an inventory of potential urban agriculture sites on public land and in plan development. And we ranked each site as either high, medium, or low potential. And that ranking was determined by visits to sites, looking at soil quality, soil ex uh, solar exposure and slope, as well as mapping nearby community needs and services. So if you look at this map, you can see um, some of the high potential, medium potential, and low potential sites identified. And then we also looked at other key information, like nearby transit routes and population density. Plans can also include policies to promote and engage uh, community residents around urban agriculture. And here's just one example from the city of Southgate's health element, which is a chapter in their general plan focusing on community-wide strategies to improve health. Just take a minute to read this policy. What specifically do you think the city could do to support the use of public and private vacant lots, including schoolyards, for community gardens? I'll give you one example of something a community can do, which is updating their zoning and uh, making sure that urban agric agriculture activities are defined in zoning. It's important because uh, without zoning definitions and regulations, a community garden or urban farm may be actually an illegal use. And if you want to learn more about um, policies to support uh, neighborhood agriculture, including model zoning language and model, model general plan language, you can take a look at um, a toolkit that's available on our website called Seeding the City. And it's full of uh, all kinds of interesting information and considerations on crafting urban agriculture policies, as well as model policies that you can tailor to meet your local needs. And here's a few quick tips for success. So while anyone who's framed a raised bed or cleared a weed-filled plot knows that growing food can take some serious effort, there's a lot of work that happens outside the garden too, from building partnerships to signing a lease to updating zoning code. Having partners who can stick it out over the long term is key to making urban agriculture projects a reality. And of course, one size doesn't fit all. Each of the stories and examples we've shared showed how important local context is to shaping urban agriculture projects. Last, get creative and consider how urban agriculture can provide the maximum impact, whether that's linking classroom learning with outdoor experiences, using community public partnerships to make the most of underutilized open space, or building entrepreneurial skills for teens. We'll take a few questions now, and then I'll share some resources at the end. So the first question I have is actually for um, uh, Ben, and it comes from Mia. Ben, can you talk about um, any legal considerations that pro um, urban agriculture projects need to consider when they're um, growing food on school grounds, in particular if there's anything that they need to consider when doing more entrepreneurial gardening types, so uh, gardens that might include sales? Uh, yes, good question. Um, I should note that the product highlighted uh, by Heather earlier on in the webinar, Dig, Eat, and Be, Be Healthy, actually has a small section on schools specifically. Uh, California has an interesting statutory scheme wherein it, some argue that you have to be a certain type of public entity to engage in community gardens or other types of ur urban agriculture on school grounds. Others do not take that position, but I think uh, – it's important to note that there is a difference of opinion on whether an individual nonprofit group or an individual group of residents can access school property to grow food, even if it's unused or underutilized school property. So that's legal point number one. And again, Dig, Eat, and Be Healthy has some discussion on that. Um, the other issues to keep in mind with regards to school property, I think one of which I mentioned, which was access to the site. Many schools deem um, volunteers uh, to be to fall under the rubric of school volunteers, even if they're not working at the school. So if you're volunteering at a garden that's on a school site, you may have to go through uh, background checks because of your potential encounter with the students. So that's certainly one issue. Um, and in terms of other entrepreneurial issues, 
if you, uh, I, I know of examples of uh, people that have set up for sale uh, gardens or urban ag projects on school property. So I know it's happening, and I think the only issue that comes up is, uh, you know, who's benefiting from that sale, where's the money going, et cetera. That could become a more complicated legal issue depending on how it's set up, and I'm happy to follow up with folks offline to, chat, to talk through about that as well. Thanks, Ben. And we're actually at time, so if you didn't have your question answered, uh, we'll be following up uh, with folks by email after this webinar. I appreciate everybody's participation, and I just want to highlight a couple of resources you might be interested in going forward. So a number of images in this webinar were actually provided courtesy of the Mendocino County Community Action Agency's Garden Project, and you should definitely check out their Flickr page for ideas and inspiration on garden design and activities. It's pretty amazing. And you can see that here. Um, also of note, uh, PolicyLink has a online urban agriculture toolkit that has profiles of successful urban agriculture projects and best practices. Definitely worth taking a look. Um, you can download any of the resources mentioned here at Change Lab Solutions website. And don't forget to check out the extras, like the sample agreements we've collected for using public land for urban agriculture. You can find those in the downloads section on the page. For more information about anything discussed in this webinar, you can contact Betty Sun or Lisa Tadlock with the Network for a Healthy California. And as always, Change Lab Solutions is a nonprofit organization that does not provide legal advice. On behalf of uh, Ben, Amanda, everyone at the Network for a Healthy California, I want to say thanks for tuning in, and be sure to check out the other webinars in this series. Thank you so much. <laughs>